Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen Quo, and I am a program manager with Nevada Humanities. On behalf of the organization, it's really my pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. So for those of you who don't know who we are, Nevada Humanities is our state's affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. We try to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. Nevada Humanities is also the host for the Nevada Center for the Book, which is our state's affiliate of the Center for the Book housed at the Library of Congress. For this year's Library of Congress National Book Festival, we're thrilled to be featuring our local author, Axie O, oh, and her book, The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea, as our YA selection for the Great Places from Great, Great Reads from Great Places reading list. So the National Book Festival is taking place this year in Washington, D.C. on September 3rd, 2022, with the theme, Books Bring Us Together. So just as a reminder, today's webinar is going to be recorded. We're going to share it on our Nevada Humanities website and our YouTube channel once the video is ready. But we would love, love, love to hear from all of you viewers in the, in the audience today about your thoughts about Axie's work, your favorite fantasy retellings, any questions you might have for our two authors. So please feel free to share your comments and questions in our chat for everyone to see. So I now could not be happier to be introducing these two brilliant Nevada authors to all of you. Axie O oh is the New York Times bestselling author of The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea, XOXO, and the Rebel Soul series. Born in New York City and raised in New Jersey, she studied Korean history and creative writing as an undergrad at the University of California, San Diego, and holds an MFA in writing for young people from Lesley University. Her passions include K-pop, anime, stationery supplies, and milk tea, and she currently resides in Las Vegas, Nevada, with her dogs Layla and Toro, who is named after Totoro. Nassim Jamnia is a former neuroscientist and MFA graduate from the University of Nevada, Reno. They are the author of The Bruising of Kilwa, their work has appeared in the Washington Post, Cosmopolitan, The Rumpus, The Writer's Chronicle, and other publications. They have received fellowships from Bitch Media, Lambda Literary, and the otherwise, and they were named the inaugural Samuel L. R. Delaney Fellow from Catstone Books. Nassim is also the managing editor at Sword and Kettle Press, which is a tiny independent publishing house of inclusive feminist speculative fiction, and the former managing editor at SideQuest.Zone, which is an independent gaming criticism website. A Persian Chicagoan, Nassim now lives in Reno with her husband, dog, and two cats. So Nassim, I am going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks so much, Kathleen. And, and thanks everyone for, for joining us. We're, we're super, both super psyched to, to be here. Um, and I'm so excited to talk to Axie about The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea, this absolutely beautiful, beautiful book. So um, Axie, I wanted to just like for, for people who maybe are familiar with your other work, but haven't read this one yet, if you could just give us like a brief summary of it, and then we can kind of dive into why you decided to write it. Yeah, so The Girl Fell Beneath the Sea is my first YA fantasy novel. Um, so it's a uh, young adult novel for, I guess, ages, what's YA, 13 to 18 or 12? Yeah, rough, roughly, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's about um, a girl, it's a retelling of a classic Korean folktale, but it's about a girl, Mina, whose land is cursed by the sea god. And um, every year they send uh, maidens into the sea to like appease his wrath. And then that year, Mina's um, brother's, girlfriend. <laughs> um, Shim Chung is the sea god's bride. And so Mina is like, no, she goes and she um, she's the one who goes into the sea. Instead, she like sacrifices herself or more like she wants to protect her brother and his and Shim Chung. She goes in this, into the sea and she discovers the sea god is under, he's asleep and he's under this curse. And so she has to figure out how to break the curse. And it, meanwhile, she meets other gods, other spirits, and mythical creatures. So it's a, it's very um, fun. It kind of um, I was kind of trying to channel Ghibli vibes with this book. You succeeded. It, it has <laughs> it has strong strong Ghibli vibes. Um, and uh, what I love about it, I mean, it's just like it's it's a really really beautiful story. It's like super accessible. I mean, we both obviously read a lot of YA as people who write YA. Um, but it's really accessible for like all ages. I definitely could see someone younger wanting to read this. It's, it's yeah. certainly, certainly appropriate. Um, and uh, I, I love like the the scenes of her like going around in the city and like meeting, you know, a new spirit. I would say new people, but technically spirits and like encountering familiar ones. Uh, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's such a blast and it's a very, very quick read. Um, but I wanted to like dive into like why you sat down to write this book, right? In the acknowledgement, you call it the book of your heart, which I love. I love reading people's books of their hearts. So um, what inspired you to write this? Yeah, so, you know, 
I mean, you're probably the same where I, I read a ton of um, YA retellings when I was like, I was born in the late 80s, read a ton of like Robin McKinley, um, Patricia McKillop. Do you know, is this like ringing a bell for you? <laughs> and like they did, uh, these, these uh, fantasists did a lot of um, retellings of classic, I guess, you know, cl Western folk tales. Um, or I guess they're not folk tales, I guess they're more like more fairy tales. And that was like my favorite type of book um, growing up. So I knew when I started publishing, I, my first series was a sci-fi series, Rebel Soul, <laughs> Rogue Heart. Um, I knew I always wanted to write a fantasy retelling. That was always, because that was my favorite, the favorite type of book to read. And we can go into this more, but um, as you can imagine, all of those fantasy retellings that I read, you know, they were all Western folk tales. So there's no, no East Asian, definitely no Korean sort of uh, fairy tales. Um, and so it was like always a dream of mine to write this story. And also, like I said, the Ghibli vibes. Um, and so that was sort of like the starting point. I actually saw a, um, a uh, prompt on a website that was like, they were asking for folk tales from non-Western traditions. And so I was like, oh, cool. So it was like for a short story. And so I actually wrote, I sat down to write this story. And I think the first chapter was like, I don't know, 2000 words. And I was like, hey, this is gonna be longer than, <laughs> longer than- <a> <laughs> I know story. that feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, whoops. Um, and so, so that's what the prompted me. But then I was like, okay, I'm gonna write the whole book. And it actually was pretty fast. Cause it was like, sort of like, this is so much fun. Um, and I like kind of wrote the whole book basically in a, in a whole summer and it just took a long time to revise a long time to sell. It took like this, this book, um, the idea came in 2014 and then I wrote it in like 2015, but it didn't sell until 2019. Yeah. So it took a long time. Um, and I call it the book of my heart because it's like just full of like Korean folk tales. Um, just all these little mannerisms the characters have, all these little traditions that the characters have that you know, I, I saw growing up in my own family, um, but also just like that kind of YA fantasy fun adventure, but like having characters who look like me, that was really important, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally, totally feel that. I read a lot of fantasy also growing up, fantasy being like the genre of my heart. Yeah. And I mean, I like don't see characters who look like me, right? Or like don't see like reflections of my own culture in there. And it's, and it's hard like as an author of color to try to break away from that because then you're faced with industry problems, right? Like, you know, that's we, we will not dwell on industry problems in this chat, <laughs> this is a happy chat. Um, but, but it is definitely, it's definitely tough. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. It took so long to sell, even though it's like this, this beautiful retelling that, should oh dog sorry um I can't, no you're good <laughs> yeah but you know like if there's nothing in it that would ring alarm bells for you know like people who are are on the the book banning boards you know like it's it's very much like a, a beautiful retelling um and I love all the little details I mean you know obviously I am not Korean so I'm sure that, like there's plenty of cultural details that went over my head but anytime like people start talking about like the food that they're familiar with right I'm yeah. like this is somebody who loves the food of their culture and they're making sure that people know that their food is delicious yeah. um, so so I totally love that um, so can you tell us a little bit more about like the actual story that that you drew inspiration from and, and why that story yeah, so the the actual story is called I, well, it's it was actually an oral tale, so it was I don't even know if it had an original name, but it's um the tale of Shin Chung, or the blind man's daughter is another another version of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's like an, a very old. There was like it's called a, a pensori. It's like a they what they used to do is they used to like dance to tell a story. So they would like all like dance and da -da -da, it would be like a whole story that's told. And I think there's only like five that are like really famous. And this is one of them, the tale of Shin Chung. And it was, I, oh, I knew about it because I had a picture book of the story when I was growing up. It was like this little picture book. It had a whole different, it had a title too. It was like called Shin Chung and the River God, I think something like that, where it had different, it had a different, it wasn't the sea, it was the river. <laughs> um, so, you know, like that kind of thing where it was like, I knew about it um, since I was young. So in a way it was as familiar to me as like a Cinderella or a Snow White. So that wasn't, when it, when it came to adapting a folktale, that's actually why I chose it because it was one that um, I knew really well. Because a lot of, a lot of the other folktales I actually didn't know about until later in life when I was like, I like went to go look for them. Like I went to like buy, I bought a Korean folktale book and I like read 
read them. Um, but this was one that just because I had a picture book, um, I also had this like book called Tales from a Korean Grandmother, and it had a bunch of different folk tales in it. I love and this that. Was one of them. Um, yeah, so oh, so the original folk tale is um, a girl, her name is Shim Chong. She lives in this village. Her father is blind. That's also why it's called the blind man's daughter. Um, and the village, there's like a, it's like the sea god is sort of, you know, <laughs> there's a drought. I think there's a drought. It's either a drought or storms, depending on the retelling. Um, and then uh, they, Shim Chun volunteers to go into the sea for 300 bags of rice. <laughs> there's an exchange. <laughs> um, and then uh, she goes into the sea, the drought, the, um, Sea God is actually a dragon, a, a bit like a sea, Korean sea dragon. He's the dragon of the East Sea, so Korea's, you know, peninsula. So it's like based off of their seas. And so he's a dragon of the East Sea of Korea. And he um, he's basically like, oh, you're a good daughter. <laughs> you're a good daughter. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna give you uh, a reward, which is that you'll live. And then so she goes back. Um, in a lotus flower, it blooms in the court of the emperor. The emperor sees her, falls in love with her, gets married, and they have a party for all the blind men and blind men or blind people in the entire uh, country. And then her father comes. Yeah, so that's and they're reunited. So it's like a actually it's a story that I guess comes out of Confucianism because the main the main like takeaway is filial piety. <laughs> Right. So yeah. that is something that I was like, okay, we'll honor that, but that's not going to be the main point of this story. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because you do tell that story in here. So I wasn't yeah. sure, you know, like what parts of it were, were part of your own imagination, yeah. what parts of it were, were you borrowing from folklore. Um, and, and we, we do see her for, you know, she does, she does show up in the book and she's, yeah. she's great. You know, she loves her dad and there's yeah. nothing wrong with loving your yeah. dad. <laughs> right. So I, yeah. um, I love that kind of subversion though, because you're, you're taking a story, which, which is about filial piety, yeah. um, which I mean, in any, in any culture that reveres any sort of elders or any or re reveres your parents, there's always this kind of element of you as the child have to always be subservient to your parents, right? Yeah. And so we get this great story where Mina is like, this is how I can save my family, right? She's doing it for her brother, which yeah. I also love, right? I'm a big on siblings. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not seeing, but at the same time, she's also in a sense doing it for herself, right? She makes yeah. decisions that she's just like, this is how I think I can honor my my background or how I can honor my family especially her grandmother um mm -hmm. but also here how can I honor myself which I think is like a, a really really beautiful balance that doesn't feel like like a middle finger to your culture it's yeah. not right it's a yeah. beautiful, really really beautiful tribute so I love that I think that's super great we have a couple of questions actually that are that are relevant to right now so um yeah. Ryan asks where you found like your resources for folk tale research and what it was like diving into writing fantasy for the first time um yes yeah, so resources um like I said like a lot of those uh, folktale books that I had um and then like as I got older actually so that original folktale that picture book I had I think I like looked at the author and it was like a white person's name I don't know maybe, <laughs> they're, maybe they could be married you know it could be a Korean author I don't know I didn't do a lot of research but I was like okay but now I like when I look for folktale books, I like to see like if, it, if it's in translation that the original author is Korean, um, does a lot of research, maybe if they're like studying, they're like um, from uh, a, a university in Korea, that's always like a great um, place. And then, um, yeah, so I do, I do, I'm very physical, like I like to have books. Um, so I like to like just go and buy books. Actually, I'm going to Korea this- um, That's exciting. I know. <laughs> in September and my my little nephew was just he had just gone to Korea and he was visiting and um he's so great he's read all my books he's 14 um but he's read all my books and he um brought with him all these Korean history books because he's like so smart he like loves to read um and I was like where'd you get those and he's like oh I bought them in English in a store in Korea and I was like I'm gonna do that so like now I have like this like list but you could get them on like you know bookstores here as well it's not like it's exclusive to Korea but I just like the idea of going to a bookstore in Korea and buying, yeah. <laughs> and buying a book um but that. That, is this your uh, first time going going to Korea or have you gone uh, before no or? yeah it's my first well it's I haven't been since 2019 so that's the last okay. time so it's been a while yeah so it's been a while so I'm excited um yeah so it's mostly uh so research yeah there's nothing wrong with, like doing research online I love doing research online my local libraries um I do a lot of um my the I we're in Vegas. Oh, shout out to the Vegas library system. It's amazing. 
I believe it's, it. It's amazing. Oh, you're in Reno. Well, I'm, I'm in, in Reno. Reno. Yeah. I don't know. It's, how's that? You know, it's, yeah. it's still a b- pretty burgeoning in kind of okay. a lot of areas, yeah. but we do have a good, like a solid library system. I use the Libby app and I listen to a gazillion audiobooks. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, like Vegas, I like, I think I like typed in like Korean book, like history. And it was like uh, 30 pages of like books you could just yeah, go. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So what about when you were, you know, you read a lot of fantasy growing up. I think, I mean, like, you know, if, if you want to write in a genre, you should read in that genre. <laughs> right? Like, this should be a non-brainer. Um, yeah. But what was it like diving into writing fantasy for the first time? Since you, especially since you came from, from sci-fi and from um, contemporary fiction. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it just felt like coming home. Actually, my first book I ever wrote that is never published was a fantasy. It was like a straight up portal fantasy, you know. <laughs> you know As one does, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Although they're like, com- they're having a comeback, at least in like the Japanese like manga. It's like a whole like, like genre of portal fantasy is like super popular. And I was like, well, I love them too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was like a portal fantasy. So it wasn't actually that, it was like kind of like coming home kind of thing. And like I was telling you, my favorite, my favorite books growing up were specifically fantasy retellings, actually. It wasn't even just fantasy as a genre, um, which I love, but like fantasy retellings as a subgenre was like my favorite. So it wasn't, um, it was actually, I guess all the difficulties were just, you know, what you would normally have difficulties with, with any, anything, world building always hard. Yeah, <laughs> I could talk for days yeah. about world building and uh, <laughs> challenges and joys. Your world building is amazing. I'm Thank like, you. so everything, like everything that like that's in this book, I'm like, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. <laughs> Thanks. I had a good time. I mean, I've been, I've been working in, in the world of Kilwa, not, not Kilwa specifically, actually, the feed, the main character's home country, Del Moon. I've been working in that world for a few years now. So um, cool. yeah, so I, so I, you know, could, could do some more world building work, hopefully on the line level, but it's complicated. It's a novella, not a novel. And so people are unhappy. Everyone's, everyone's unhappy. I'm happy. It's fine. I'm happy. It's so good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, no, I, I, I love all of that. So let's, um, I hope we have some more good questions kind of about like the writing stuff. So I guess we'll, we'll kind of go on there, but, um, Ryan again asked like, how did you approach writing the gods and like writing the personality and, and like the gods and spirits in this they have very distinct personalities. They know who they are, even when they claim that they don't know who they are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear a little more of that. And the um, the myth- and some of the spirits are like drawn from mythological, at least creatures, if not figures. Yeah. So I'd be definitely love to hear a little bit more about that too. Yeah, um, the gods are definitely, they're not actually, they're actually not based on any kind of actual Korean gods. <laughs> Um, even the Korean underworld is nothing like the spirit realm. The actual like Korean underworld of the mythology is like a lot darker. There's a great movie if you want to like know about it. It's called I think like Along with the Gods. It's like this great Korean film you can watch. It's very it's very dark. My husband and I love Korean films, so I'm gonna have yeah. to put this on. The list. Oh yeah, it's fun. It's like it's fun, um, but it's like they go to like the Korean like basically Korean hell, and it's like you know circles of hell, and like each place you go is like awful, like more and more awful. <laughs> And it's like funny, like what the, I guess not funny, but it's like interesting, like what the things that they care about are. Like if you, I guess like in Greek mythology, they have like rings of like, I don't know, hell. Then you're like, that makes sense because I don't know, the whole like pride or whatever will be something that, well, yeah, like there's we, like a section yeah. for, for section for like heroes to go, right. And then there's a section yeah. that like everyone else gets to go. So yeah, yeah. It, does, it does reflect the culture for sure. Yeah. But like in the Korean hell, like one of the worst things you can do is is um like be bad to your parents like that like that's yeah, worse than murder <laughs> you know it's like it's like oh okay yeah it's so things like that it's like interesting um but anyway so but my book is completely it was that's like the fantasy part um so what I do what I love to do is you know there are like cultural touchstones like things that like um uh that are like very, that are real. Like they they're, they exist in Korean culture. They're like real mythological things. And then I sort of just like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this a fantasy thing. So like, uh, for example, the Imugi um, are actual Korean mythological creatures. They're proto dragons. And the, the myth is that they um, are snakes, snakes that if you, they fight either in a thousand battles or live for a thousand years, they, um, 
you know, we can become dragons. So I was like, this is, this is so cool. So I like played with that. And so I created a character who was like, kind of like snarky, kind of a fun character. And um, I like made this whole thing where it's like, there was actually a part that got cut where I was like, he talks about like how, how he has like 800 brothers. <laughs> I love him. That's so sad that we didn't get to see that. <laughs> because it's like, I'm thinking of like snakes, like snakes probably have like, right. I don't even know, like a ton of eggs. Right. Um, so he's just like, yeah, I got like 800 brothers. That's why I don't really care. <laughs> like, oops, that one died. Or like, the cousin, like, 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 like the whole idea is that I was like, well, I needed, I needed like a villain creatures that would, you know, would, um, make, uh, you know, threaten the realm. And so I was like, okay, so I'm going to make a ton of these, a moogie and I don't think that's a thing like I, I just made that up I was like okay well I know that there are movie exists and I'm going to add this other element that makes it more it fits the story yeah so that's sort of like how I work off like I'm not very like because it said because these are the rules of the fantasy the rules of the mythology mythology I don't have to stick to it that's not how I feel yeah yeah, that's smart. Uh, I definitely feel like my hands get tied when I research something and I'm like, oh no, that's like not yeah. accurate to what I'm writing. And now I don't know like what to do with myself because yeah. this isn't accurate. So I, I really like that kind of freedom. Um, do you see this as a secondary world? I mean, it's like, it's big mm -hmm. enough that it could be primary world, but I wasn't sure. I was just curious whether you see it as a secondary world. Yeah, I guess, I guess it has that sort of, like, I guess it's between. Yeah. Like, you, you, I never call it Korea. I never say anything that's like, there's no history involved kind of thing. Um, so in that way, like an, in like a, like a fantasy, I kind of sort of you can, you can know that it's created because it's a peninsula. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're obviously the words I'm using. I mean, Xincheng, I use the original name, which is, yeah. you know, an actual character from a folktale. Um, so I guess, yeah, like a secondary, I, I guess like, yeah, secondary world fantasy with like a lot of um, markers that someone who's familiar with will can recognize. Yeah, yeah, I, it is kind of Ghibli-esque in, in that sense because yeah. you watch so many like like Studio Ghibli movies and you're like, yeah. oh, this like this has like a vague maybe this is supposed to be like Japan or or wherever, yeah. but it but it's fantasy. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's doing it, it's doing its own fun thing. Yeah. Um, so I love that. I think that that's super great. Um, okay, let's see. We answered that. Um, actually, this this is a good question. I, I think for both of us, Ryan asks like, what keeps us drawn and inspired by fantasy? And since we both yeah. like kind of that's our you know was our original home genre or whatever the case may be, I think that's a really really good question. Like, what do you what do you love about fantasy? What do you keep coming back to? Um, I love well, I love how fantasy has so many subgenres. Um, like uh, contemporary fantasy can be set like in the in the contemporary world as we know it but then there's fantasy elements I think that's really cool um would you you would you say your book is a secondary fantasy secondary yeah world? it's definitely secondary yeah. world I think some of the marketing says it's it's uh, historical fantasy it's not a secondary <laughs> world <laughs> yeah historical fantasy always confused me because I was like does historical fantasy mean it has to be like historical but with fantasy elements or does it mean like it's just like fantasy that's like a little older at time <laughs> Yeah, I th I don't know because like I think about the books that are kind of marked as historical fantasy, and and the one that immediately comes to mind is She Who Became the Sun, which okay. is very history. It's, it's historical. It's like 1400s China, and it's retelling of um, oh, which emperor is it? I'm now blanking on which emperor it, it, it is yeah. retelling. Um, but the fantasy elements are really light. Like it reads like a historical fiction until yeah. you get to like the Mandate of Heaven, and they're like, here's fireballs coming out of my. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a beautiful book i highly highly recommend it definitely not YA. it's definitely adults um there there is a sex scene in it and, and everything but um yeah i i think it's i don't know like this is kind of one of those things where genres are porous right because yeah. i think about like the devabod trilogy which is again adult but it is yeah. friendly friendly for for um for for teens as well yeah. and it starts off as a portal fantasy right it's set in egypt during the napoleonic era and then it transitions to, to this magical world. It hangs out in the magical world for a while. Stuff happens. Um, so uh, yeah, I, th I think there some of these these distinctions are definitely for marketing, and some of some of it sometimes it's it's helpful, right? Like I love secondary worlds for sure, but who doesn't love a good portal? Like who doesn't who doesn't love like who didn't watch Inuyasha where you jump in a well and then you you end up in in vast past time? I mean, just like <laughs> there's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that's, you know, that's what I love about fantasy. You could do anything you want. I mean, there, 
it's interesting because like our, our fantasies do incorporate more like culture um which is something that I feel like is happening for sure more ever since we need diverse books actually we're going to talk I know we're going to spoiler alert, we're going to talk a little bit more about um books that we recommend yeah. well, most of them are books that are like that where it's like the maybe the uh, inspiration was a culture or was you know the author's heritage um and I think that's just so cool because we didn't have that maybe 20 years ago mm, yeah um, that kind of stuff so I just think it's so interesting I love I love playing with it too like like I like um like I was saying I love starting with something that's real like um uh the red string of fate which is a east asian uh myth that's like you can find in japan china as well what that is it's like it's supposed to um, tie soulmates together like that's like an invisible red string that ties soulmates together and it's also in korean um legend and so I was like well it'd be fun if it was like a contract marriage or it's like (laughs) we don't like each other have to have to hang out um and then it's like you know one character dies the other one dies because they're connected by this red string of fate um you know things like that where it's like that's not in actual legend that's that's all like fantasy but the actual legend exists it's just we I fantasize it things like that I think is really fun fantasy You know, what's interesting is that that rings true, I think, to a lot of people's experiences with their own oral traditions and their cultures, because a lot of the time, so like I I come from West Asia, I come from the Middle East, and we have a lot of oral traditions, such as A Thousand and One Nights or in Iran, the Shahnameh. And, you know, there's all there's so there's like, you know, a theoretically a written account. I say theoretically, because again, these are oral storytelling. So at some point, someone like collected some of them or didn't collect some of them. And then people kind of add to that tradition as time goes on. Like you'll hear a story and you'll be like, that's not in the Shoname. Like you totally made that up. But it's kind of when, when it is an oral tradition, it lends itself to the storyteller being able to expand upon that tradition, yeah. right? Like, I mean, and that stretches back like thousands and thousands of years, people taking their own spin on, on oral tradition. So I actually think like in a sense, you're taking your own spin on and is doing exactly what people have been doing for thousands of years. And I think that's beautiful. Like, I, I think that's super great. Yeah. Um, and I also love the <laughs> this contract marriage. Um, it's, it's funny because like, I, I think the nice thing about having the cultural elements is that people who are familiar with the culture are going to see them, right? They're going to be like, oh, I totally like yeah. know this, this, what like the red string of fate is supposed to mean. And it's definitely like accessible enough that if you've never heard of it, um, in which case how, I mean, it's a pretty common motif. So I think most, a lot of people have you know heard of it at least, but um, if you're familiar with it, you can see how it's changed. And if you're not familiar with it, you see like a cool interpretation of a thing you've never seen before, right? Yeah. So I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, and just because I'm staring at the cover, is is the magpie? Is that like a is that a like a, a symbol thing, or where you're like, nah, magpies are cool? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's both. Uh, <laughs> the uh, magpie is the um, like symbolic bird of Korea. So like you know, oh, like okay. you know, yeah, like most, all countries have like a bird or like a flag, I right? Think so right? yeah. <laughs> um, the magpie is Korea's bird. Um, and it's usually blue, The it's not red. It's actually never red, it's blue. <laughs> um, but uh, I actually, I went to, um, my grandfather is an architect, uh, he was, but he was an architect in Korea. And we, so we went to, um, he designed the uh, UN Memorial in uh, the South, uh, a city called Busan is in the South of Korea or yeah, the, the South of the peninsula. Yeah. Um, and we were visiting and I saw these like little magpies all over the graves and they were like so sweet and cheerful. And I was like, I love magpies. And I needed, I needed her bird. I mean, her bird, her soul to turn into something. So it just was like, okay, a magpie. So yeah. it was less, yeah. So it was less like, cause like the lotus flower is a huge symbol for Shincheon, which is mm-hmm. why the lotus flowers on the, um, cover like that's a big symbol for the actual folktale but like the magpie the red string of fate um those are not in the original folktale those were just things that was fun but they're korean they're like korean yeah, but they're korean yeah no I, I find that really interesting that you took like but this is again like if you're familiar with the culture you yeah. see that and you're like oh like i see this cultural reference that you're making yeah um, and then if you're not like me i'm just like i feel like that is a reference that i yeah. am not getting but it's beautiful right and this is not really a spoiler or read the soul because it happens within the first like 30 pages. oh yeah yeah so, like, like this sorry. is not, this is not a, a spoiler no no i mean just like um i mean i i hope y'all who are who are who are watching have read the book but if you haven't that's not a spoiler <laughs> it happens very early um so yeah I love that I love and can we just like again like look at this cover people this cover is so beautiful 
<laughs> oh, your cover designer knocked it out of the park. It's that so was um, one of the things I asked, like one of the main things I wanted was to have a girl in a, in a hanbok, Korean traditional dress in the cover. That was like really important to me. And so they delivered. <laughs> Yay. Yay. That's exciting. Yeah, no, I, um, at least from a reader's perspective, I think they knocked the cover out of the park. So it's so You good. have like this beautiful architecture in your cover. Was that, were you like, did you have the input on, into the cover design? No, so it's funny because I, you know, we, we sold the book in February and they were like, okay, we're going to do like spring 2022. And I was like, that's very fast for publishing. Wow, yeah. Like I know, like very, very fast for publishing, but I sold it to a small press. And so they have like a lot less on their, on their docket. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, was and, looking, I was looking at your press's website and they have like, the titles are amazing. They have some like really, really amazing. They've got some, yeah. I mean, they have like all of Peter S. Beagle's collection. Yeah. Like he only publishes oh, with them. Jane Yolen right. publishes with them. I know. Yeah. And um, <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, yeah, so they're, they're, I mean, and, and poor Peter S. Beagle has been going through some legal stuff, but like Tachyon oh, is his yeah. publisher, you know, yeah. like, like the, the head of the press is really good friends, but cool. no, it's funny. So like we sold the book, we had this day and I was like doing edits. I turned in edits and then August, like a literal year before the book comes out, I just receive this, this cover in my inbox. And I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> my cover just dropped in my inbox. Um, and it was funny because if they had asked me like, hey, what would you want on the cover? I'd be like, I have no God in clue. Like I, okay. I, I, because like this in the novella in so many ways is not like other books that I've written. Um, uh -huh. It's especially like it, it, books that are in this universe. Like the, the books I'm working on right now are in first person. They have multiple narrators, mm -hmm. but this is like not so I mean it is so much about the same main character but it's much more like about this kind of situation about the situation mm -hmm. the main character finds himself in and so like when this appeared in my inbox I was like this exactly is like I didn't even know this was the cover I wanted right like yeah. it emphasizes the city we see some of the blood magic the vines are a allusion to, to stuff that happens later in the book um and I got which you can't really see because it's on my arm but I got the city tattooed because I was just like so so like I have to send you a picture because yeah, you cannot you. see it like that so cool um but yeah no I just like the their in-house designer Elizabeth Story like knocked out of the park and there's like these these the inside of the book is also beautiful and I just yeah I'm in love with like the book as a product it's, it's yeah it's great <laughs> we got lucky on, yeah. on our covers <laughs> so you no know, yeah because you have like well the, okay I want to show that that's that's year three <laughs> Year three is the epilogue. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, here, year one. Here we go. Yeah, just like this beautiful yeah. filigree, and like it, it, yeah. it feels right, and I'm very, really happy with with how the book looks physically too. Turned out, yeah. so yeah, it's nice when uh, we have talented press people behind yeah. us. Just, Make us look good. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and I, and I have no problem like bragging about the physical book because yeah, I I, did, I was not involved with the physical yeah. books process, right? So I can like I can brag about this without. I know. I know. That's like totally doing. a thing, though. It's like when someone's like, "Tell me about your cover." I love that question because I'm like, "Well, Curry Huang, genius." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? About, like I don't have to be like, "Oh, because my writing is so great." It's like no. It is. This is this is great. Yeah. 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 It's a nice, it's a nice way to do promo, but also be like, but this person did such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, was this this was a different press than um your other books, right? Yeah. How yeah. was that process switching over to different editors and, and different stuff? If you don't mind talking about it, we don't have to go into it. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Rebel Soul and Rogue Heart were with Lee and Low Books, mm -hmm. which is um, a small press that are amazing. They do um, they, they do the work. <laughs> they do the work, and they like yeah. um, like so. Actually, new, the Rebel Soul won their New Visions Award. So every year they have what they call the New Visions, the New Voices Award, which is um, they publish the winner is published by them, and it has to be an author of color or ind indigenous author who is unpublished and unagented. So it's like a really great. It was like such a like. They like did such an amazing job on the book. Um, and they, my team, their team was like very small. It's like very small, but like so passionate. Mm. And I met, um, I think, cause it's Leon Lowe. And I think I met Jason Lowe. Anyway, I met one of the, I met one of the- uh, one, one of the L's. <laughs> of the team. Um, and, um, it was wonderful at the uh, ALA, the American Library Association. Um, that was like such a cool experience. But yeah, so I published with them, but they also focus mostly on school library markets too, because they a lot of their books are um, middle grade or they have amazing picture books. 
um, and graphic novels. So when I did um, my fantasy, um, it's more of like a more of like, I guess, like more commercial YA fantasy book. And so we did Girls with Macmillan and then XOXs with Harper. XOXO is IP. So that, that's like an intellectual uh. property. Yeah. So I was actually, um, I guess, I had to audition to to do it. They like gave me like a, it was actually funny because they gave me um, like a like a prompt and I was like, I, I'm an ex, I'm the K-pop expert here. <laughs> I, just, like, I like disregarded their like whole prompt and I was like, I can do my own thing. And they're like, that. you look like, you seem like you know what you're doing. So they're like, we'll, we'll take you. Um, so yeah, so I, that's why I have like all these different, that's why I think it's so interesting, with, like with publishing, I feel like, or, you know, your career as a writer, there's so many different pathways you can take. There's so many different things you can do. Um, and so like, I guess my pathway is to, to be published with three publishers right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's cool though. I'm, I'm doing an IP project too right yeah. now for a middle grade book um, with, a, it, with yeah. a packager. And uh, it's really funny because I also, I got their like detailed, you know, synopsis and like their character breakdowns or whatever. Yeah. And they're like this, you know, they, there's this character, I have to talk kind of vaguely because we haven't sold the book yet, but like right. there's this character that they, that presents kind of tomboyish, but they're like, oh, but she's definitely a girl. And I'm like, kind of queer this, you know? yeah. <laughs> just like, and they were excited, right? They were like, yeah. you know, they, yeah. they wrote kind of these characters where they're probably kind of picturing them as like white, just kind of middle-class kids. Yeah. And I was just like, making this a kid of color, making this a kid of color, this one's yeah. biracial. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that like one of the great things about, you know, uh, IP projects is mm -hmm. that, you know, someone else is doing the hard work of figuring out the story, right? But mm -hmm. then when you find an author that like believes in that story, they put their yeah. own spin on it. And I think that's really lovely. And I want to do more IP work. So people hire us for IP work. <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> great. Okay. Yeah. So so that was probably, yeah, that's like three very, very different experiences in publishing because you have like the books that you wrote, like unagented, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, kind of trusting, trusting your publisher has your best interest, which Lee and Lowe does really great work for, yeah. for the kid-lit community. So I'm sure they, they did have your best interest. And then we have your, your an IP project, which is yours, but not quite yours. And then, mm -hmm. so this is like the, you know, this is, this is your like baby of Hey, I, I have an agent and I and I like sold went on submission yeah, this, and sold the book. So it's amazing. Yeah, this was the book that got me my agent. This was the book. Yeah. <laughs> this was the only book I've ever been on sub with. Yeah. It took a long time. Yeah, yeah God. <laughs> like sub is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it did sell. And then I, I feel like it had um it like I was talking to my agent afterward and we were kind of like, wow, because it got it, it it even though it took so long, like the first time we went on sub was 2016. Um, and then we went out again in 2019 and it actually didn't sell. I said 2019, but it didn't really, it didn't sell until January, 2020, 2020. Gosh, yeah. that must've been stressful then, like right on the cusp of pandemic about to happen. Oh, yeah, it was before this yeah. book. Yeah. I was like, thank goodness that it sold before. <laughs> I mean, I think it was fine. Publishing was, did great during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, uh, I was very, very like, it was like one of those things where it's like, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? And then if I feel like it happened for the, for like the best situation it could for this, mm. for the book. And so like, I, even though it was like a struggle, you know, when you're like, wow, that took so long. It's like, well, if it didn't take that long, would it, would it have happened this way? Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely like, I definitely credit all of the authors, like the uh, we need diverse books, but also all the authors who published afterward sort of like paved the way so that uh, a book like this could be published. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And you're paving the way for other books like this to be published too, yeah. right? I mean, like yeah. that's, that's, I think a lot of us have the dream of like seeing our book as a comp for someone, yeah. you know? So like yeah. now this could be a comp for like yeah. another Korean author who is just like, yeah. oh, I really want to tell like X story from our culture. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Sorry, so that's really sorry exciting. for the long title. <laughs> <laughs> that's really hard to put in a tweet, but yes, it's a comp. <laughs> it's pretty funny because my husband's like, wait, what's the book called? And I'm like, this is not that hard, honey. Like, <laughs> It's not that complicated of a time. I mean, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it fits the like folklorish feel of it though. Like it definitely feels like an appropriate title for what this book is. Um, and that's exactly what happened. She falls beneath the sea yeah. and she discovers like a whole new life down there. So um, I love it a lot. This is actually just because I've been wanting to ask this question, but um, I don't know how to ask this question without spoilers, but I really mm. love the characters of Mask and Die. Yeah. I think they're they're like, 
I love them from the moment they appeared. And then when we get like the conclusion of what their story is, it's so satisfying. And like, yes, this is exactly like what I wanted this to come home to. Um, were they like part of the early drafts or did they come around later? Um, they were always part of the early drafts, but when they appeared is the first time I ever knew it was going to happen. So it was like, they like, um, so there's a scene right before that where Mina's telling the story and then I was like, hmm, and then they appear. And then I was like, huh, okay. And then I kind of knew who they would be, um, who they were, but, um, but so it was never like, I didn't, I wasn't like, I'm going to put these characters, like, I, I didn't like make a character list. Mm. Like I knew Mina from the main, I knew her from the start. I knew her brother, I knew her uh, grandmother. But when they appeared in the story is the first time like they appeared to me too. Okay. The first so that was actually really fun. Cause I was like, Ooh, so I knew you know, what, what role they would play when they first appeared. It, it wasn't like in revision. It was kind of like, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Sometimes like, I, I think this probably happens to all artists where you just like, you think you have a thing done, you know, no matter how much of a planner or not planner you are, you're like, okay, like, la la la, And then something surprises you. You're like, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> like This surprised me too. And like, you know, that's why, you know, a lot of times we say like our characters speak to us or, or whatever, yeah. because suddenly things happen on the page. It's you're like, I, I didn't plan this, but thanks. <laughs> you either made my life more difficult or more joyful or sometimes both. <laughs> Um, so I love them. They're my, they're my favorite. I, I, they are a delight. Um, and that was, yeah, that was so, when that happened, I closed the book and I was like, this is such a good book. <laughs> just like, <laughs> ah, yes, I feel so satisfied. <laughs> um, um, for your book, um, do, do you like know your characters before, before you, well, you said you were working in this world for a while. So did you, were these characters part of that world as well? Or were they like, you kind of created them for, um, bruising a pillow? I actually, I created them for this. So like the okay. characters that I have there, the characters that I've had before are actually very tangentially mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, there's, um, the, there, they mentioned like the new queen in, in Firuz's home, home, were, um, home country. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the, that, that queen is a character in the sequel to the novel I'm writing right now, which is actually its prequel, which tells the story <laughs> of the genocide. I know, like, why did I do this to myself? Love it. <laughs> um, and uh, there's, uh, I don't know how far in you've gotten, but there's very, very brief mention of a monstrous bird happening in Del Moon. Like that's a whole character. There's a whole mythology for that too. Um, but no, Fido is like, I mean, when I sat down to try to figure out, I was, you know, like I, I, I tell this story a lot of like, I was trying to figure out how to write a short story. I failed. I wrote a novella <laughs> that's bordering on novel length um, <laughs> and could have been a novel, oh, if, you know, if I, if I wanted it to. Fido was kind of like, I knew I wanted to write about a healer. Yeah. like came and Kofi came soon after yeah. and actually Afsona is the one that kind of popped up like as I'm writing I'm like oh this character just kind of appeared I wasn't expecting this character <laughs> character to appear um and yeah and, and you know it wasn't it was pretty soon into like the drafting process where I realized like the story I wanted to tell was bigger than the short story and yeah. that I wanted there to be like this element of Fidu's having a, a younger brother all of my stories have to have siblings in them I have a sibling complex um so I, I want and I knew the story I wanted to tell regarding that as well so um yeah the characters Malika was probably the last added character mm. um and she was kind of a surprise but I was like Fidu's needs a friend so, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna write her in um yeah but no it's definitely like the world first the characters kind of came to me and I'm and I'm pleased I mean like I there's so much more I know I could have done but there I'm really the the one thing about like publishing is that once the story is out of your hands it's out of your hands right like yeah. you give it into the hands of readers who now then take the direction that they want to go yeah. and, I, and I think that's like what's beautiful about literature right yeah. and, and about kind of like any media you consume but like especially a book that's meant to be standalone now the reader's imagination can take hold and can go on and uh do fun things so yeah. I don't know why I'm like flipping. I'm like, it's like sitting on my desk. I'm just like flipping through it as if I'm looking. Because it's, it's like, like it's, it has that great floppy. It does you know, have a good floppy. flop. <laughs> it really does. That's like great something flop. nice about about heart of uh, paperbacks. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got some more questions. Um, okay. In the interest of time, since we only have 15 minutes left, I guess we can talk a little bit about what we're going to do for Lit Crawl since that's coming mm -hmm. up. So, um, you know, if, if you're at all familiar with Nevada Humanities, which you may or may not be, but we, until the pandemic happened, Nevada Humanities was doing a Northern Nevada literary crawl every year. 
um, and then the pandemic happened. But so this year is, is the first year that it's back after many years, and we're both going to be on a panel, actually, on um, 12th. 30. 30. I just looked 1230 <laughs> at, at, in the yard at Sundance books. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. It's at Sundance. Great. Sundance is uh, one of the, the few independent bookstores in, in Reno. Um, so it's September 10th. Uh, if you guys are in the Reno area, I hope you come out. It's all free. It's, it's a lot. It's been a, a lot of fun in the past. It's going to be a lot of fun this year. A lot. I think it's probably going to be the biggest it's been so far. And uh, we're going to be talking about folklore. Yeah, it's like going to be our thing, right? So yeah. I don't know what else we're going to talk about besides folklore. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we could talk about folklore for hours and hours and hours. And we're going to yeah. be joined by um, Unkang Ko. Uh, I think um, they're out there in Reno. Do you know? Have you? Do you know I them? haven't. I haven't met them. No, but I think they're a professor in the art department. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to be, it's going to be cool because we have the like <laughs> writing perspective and then we have kind of an artistic perspective and <laughs> academic perspective. Yeah. So, um, so that, that should be a lot of fun, but yeah, I, th I don't know if the pro all the programming is live yet, but um, Nevada Humanities should have that on online. Um, so yeah, we have some Oh yeah, yeah. We've got in the in the chat the, a link to, oh, yeah. to her website. So Yay. that is um, that's that's super exciting. But yeah, we hope you hope if you're if you're in northern Nevada, hopefully you guys can can come out because this is going to be a lot of fun, lots of good food, lots of good good stuff happening. So I'm so um, excited. My first time, um, not to Reno. I've been to Reno, um, but not. To, I'm sorry. Uh, I think to the very crawl. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you're coming with your mom, right? Yeah, my mom is coming. We're coming. Um, we might rent a car and we might drive to Tahoe. <laughs> that sounds fun. That's gonna be so great. Yay. Yeah. Is your is your family in Vegas with you? Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Wait, this is like unrelated, but how'd you get from the East Coast to Vegas? Oh yeah. So like if you read my bio, <laughs> I'm from New York. Uh, or I grew up in New Jersey. So I'm from New Jersey. Let's Let's be real. Um, <laughs> I was born in New York, but only lived there for two years. Um, my dad got a job here in Vegas. Yeah. So I actually came when I was in, uh, I was like entering high school. I was in my second year of high school. I came to Vegas from New Jersey. <clears throat> so when my grandma still lives in New Jersey, so I was actually just in New Jersey like two weeks ago mm. um, to see my grandma. And we actually went to, um, you know, the composer for the Ghibli films, Joe Hisaishi. Mm or Hisaishi, I'm not sure, he did, he never, I was hoping he would say his name aloud, but he never did, um, but he, <laughs> he um, was um, touring with the orchestra. That's awesome. Like all the music, yeah, so it was, it was funny, because like every, like, every song, I just, like, was crying, because it's not even just the music, it's, like, the memories, mm -hmm. like, my neighbor Totoro, I watched with yeah. my brother, and I'm, like, crying, and, yeah. I, you know, my sister and I, we bond over Nausicaa, I'm, like, crying, so I was, like, <laughs> whole show I'm just like crying it was like it was like so it was such a nice moment yeah that sounds amazing I love that and that's just the thing like you know we were talking about literature but also music does that yeah. right where music you're thinking about like where was I when I heard this melody or, yeah. or whatever then who was I with and what is that that memory so I bet that I can imagine I would also be sobbing I'm like I love this so much um, so I absolutely love that should we do some of our favorite books or books that oh, were? Yeah, we should yeah. talk about some of that stuff. <laughs> I have a list of like 22 debuts because I am a 22 debut. And yes. so I'm just like, I'm going to rip the rest of the 22 debuts. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, um, a 22 yeah. debut, do you know Akshaya Raman? Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. been hoping to pick up that on audio yeah. actually. Because... Uh, this is actually Akshaya's like UK book. I just like the cover because it has these beautiful ladies. Um, but yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a, she's actually one of my critique partners. Oh, cool. um, I've known her for a long time and this book is amazing. It's like an Indian inspired fantasy with like lots of politics. It's about siblings. Oh, you would love this. Yeah, it is about siblings, right? There's like yeah. four of them. Yeah. Four siblings, yeah. It's been, oh, it's, um, yeah. it's been on my to read list. So yeah. Um, and it's the first in a trilogy question mark uh, duology duology okay yeah. duologies are so good yeah. um, I don't I don't have this with me because I, I lent, my, lent it to my best friend but hell falls with us by AJ white Ooh. is so good mm. it's it's um AJ is, is a white author but he's trans and it's it's like a tr very trans very queer book mm. all about fan family it had deals a lot with religious trauma so if 
you know, you have religious trauma, like maybe tread carefully. Um, mm-hmm. cause it's about like a Christian cult that's, that did the apocalypse. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. It's, um, it, I wish I could hold it because the cover is also phenomenal, but it is such a uh, like fantastic, furious, and also hopeful, like, um, kind of vision for for trans teens and mm-hmm. oh, it's so it's it's really really good okay. um I'm gonna I haven't read it yet but I'm gonna shout out Amelie Wenzhou's new book so long of silver flame mm-hmm. like night so Amelie it's wrote the blood Air trilogy just did a cover reveal, right? just did a cover reveal. Like, it's dragon. beautiful I know yeah dragons I'm like hello dragon, no, dragon. <laughs> um so yeah she she wrote the blood Air trilogy and this is her her new I don't remember if it's a trilogy or a duology based on um, Chinese culture and mythology, yeah. which I'm really, really excited for. I, that one too. I just, yeah, I saw, I remember, I saw the cover like, I think yesterday or today. Yeah, it's either yesterday or today that, that she really, released the cover. Yeah, I'm so, going to go see it. Um, and also Magic Steeped in Poison, Judy's uh, second book on Venom, Sweet and Dark came out, came today. out today, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was really impressed that I'm like, yeah. both the duology came out in one year. That must've been really intense for Judy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but it worked it was like great <laughs> yeah. I was excited I mean I I bought like a special edition so it's not going to come till October so I was like should I buy two <laughs> buy all the books I was like oh, uh, why did I do this to myself I, yeah. I guess I'll buy two that's like yeah. basically what the <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I wanted to also shout out uh Cher- Terry J Benton Walker's Blood Debts mm-hmm. it comes out in oh April. yeah I've seen the cover for that it's so this book is so good I cannot and and his his middle grade debut Alex Wise versus the end of the universe is also excellent oh, yeah. he's, he's one of my critique partners and Blood Debt like I've um <clears throat> Terry and I have been friends since I think 2017 mm. or 2018, I can't remember. Um, and so I've read like multiple drafts of Blood Debts, like before it became oh. Blood Debts. And he's had like a really long publishing journey. You know, like if you're on a publishing journey and you're like, I feel so discouraged. It took me four years to find an agent. It took Terry eight years to find an agent. And then he sold this trilogy for half a million dollars. So like, keep at it, you know, yes. right? Like, I'm so proud of him. And this yes. book is like, so, well so many, so many black teens are going to be like, yes. oh my God, like I feel so seen. And it's just, Oh, 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 and he's working on the second book like as we speak and it's it's gonna wreck people it's so good <laughs> can't wait yeah, no, I, that's I, can them, like, but... I saw the cover and I was like Otto it's going in my basket like it's happening I'm gonna get that book <laughs> yeah yeah I think that cover was was released last week the week before, yeah it was uh, like, pretty, pretty, pretty too, yeah. recently but oh. It's so good. It's so good. People are not ready. I'm so psyched. Oh man. Yeah. I've got a whole like list of books that I, I haven't read a bunch of them yet, but I want to. So like we've got Naz Kutab's The Loophole. I really want to read that. That one's about a gay Muslim Singaporean teen, I believe. Maybe. I know. I can, I can see it's like the backpack is jumping. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a, it's like a genie in the bottle sort of thing, yes. but she has like a wine glass and she's yeah. an heiress or whatever. So there's that. Um, Priyanka Talison, The Love Match, that comes oh, out. Oh, I read that. that. You read that? Oh, I so it. good. I yeah. Wait. I can't wait. So that one is, um, I think, one of the first books that has like Bengali boys on the cover. So I know that she's okay. super, super excited about that. Um, Maya it's Prasad. Like, it's so good. It's like I was reading, I was like, this is a debut, this book. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's I'm like so, so good. Yeah. Yeah. And that comes out, I think, in January because it was, you know, a lot of us have been. Yeah, it's like 2023. Yeah. Back, so yeah. Um, my Prasad's Drizzle Dreams and Love Struck Things. I'm excited for that. That's yeah. a sibling story as well. Um, Brittany S. Lewis's The Undead Truth of Us just, oh, came, that just out. came out. That just came out. Yeah. That just came out. And she's getting hit by the Barnes and Noble. The Barnes and Noble. I saw that. Yeah stuff that's going on um and that one's a zombie story starring a black team uh Aaron as as this is this is why they hate us came out today Ooh, so yeah. I'm excited to pick that up um I'm just yeah I'm gonna keep just listing Melissa Caravan's A Song of Silver and Gold is a queer Little Mermaid reimagining that came out in June from Hanson House so it's like a small small press as well um Zulfa Katuz, as long as the lemon tree grows. I'm excited for this oh, one. It's, it's, cover. Yeah. yeah, it's about a Syrian older teen who's like in pharmacy school when the yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, civil war revolution hits. Um, and that's gotten a lot of accolades. Uh, Lily Linoff's One for All is a, is a really oh fun God. Three Musketeer retelling um, starring a disabled teen. So that one I, I really liked. Kayla Cottingham's My Dearest Darkest is a horror that is starring lesbians they're very lesbians um, one of them is bi actually that's not fair I don't want to do bi erasure 
Um, and that one's really good as well. She's also an agent sibling. So of course I'm going to have to shout out agent siblings. Love it. Um, let's see, we've got house of yesterday. I'm excited for that. Ooh, that's Diba, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Diba's, uh, Zargapur's. So mm-hmm. that's an yeah. Uzbek Afghan teen, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Raquel Marie's Ophelia after all, I've heard really great things about yeah. as well. Uh, Sonora Reyes is the lesbianist guide to Catholic school. Yeah. I've heard great things. I've heard it's really funny. So, um, there's like, really just so many like books, but, but I mean, like I, what I, what this means is that so many people are getting to tell stories that they wouldn't yeah. have, been, have been able to tell 10 or 15 years ago and we can celebrate those stories. So I know it's like, it's just so exciting. just to uh, like, like so many stories, so many debuts, so many, you know, non-debuts and, um, uh, Olivia Tahi's book came out today, Azar on Fire. Yes, yes. I read that so good, especially if you're in between middle grade and YA. Perfect. Yeah, she seems to be yeah. writing in, in that because um, Perfectly Parveen, she's also 14, right? Yeah, so it's like 14. the younger younger YA. And of course, like she Iranian also, rep, so. Yeah, she also does like comedy so well. Like that's, that's something that I love to read. I love reading like humor in books, but it's it's actually, I think, rare. And it's hard to do. It's like really hard to do humor. And sh- she does humor amazing. Like, yeah. I'm psyched. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, I shouted out debuts because I'm, I'm a debut, but there's so many authors doing the work, right? That are like, oh, they're being great. <laughs> it's, just, it's just such an honor to be in this industry and seeing I like know. so many incredible minds, you know, know, getting, finally like getting, getting their shot at the mic and, and being able to publish and to keep publishing. So um yeah it's it's super great it's really really exciting mm. oh my gosh we only have a couple minutes and I'm so excited <laughs> God, it's really 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 psyched is there any of the other um q a's for your stuff that you wanted to hit mm-hmm. before we turn it over do you um do you write other genres besides fantasy? Because like this is interesting. Because I wrote, I did write sci-fi, um, and then I wrote like contemporary, and I wrote fantasy. And for me, or maybe it's because like we were talking about, we read, we read so much, and like like I, I don't think I could write um, something I don't read at all. Like I don't know what the equivalent of that would be. Maybe a I don't read John Clancy. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't write like that type of book, but, um, but like I read, I read so much contemporary. I read YA contemporary, I read a lot of YA fantasy. I read a lot of YA sci-fi. So like, to me, even though each genre is different and there are differences, like there are different things that you have to do. And there is definitely less world building in a, in a contemporary for sure. Um, and there's also things you can say where you don't have to explain it. You can say like, you know, I went on the subway, which you can right. like, you know, you'd be like, you have to be like, I don't know, there's no subway, but you know what I mean? Like you'd have to sci-fi it if it's a sci-fi book. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it's like, I, I read all those books so much, like all those genres. So it's sort of, sort of putting on my contemporary hat, putting on my fantasy hat mm-hmm. sort of thing. It's not, it's not too difficult. Like actually right, right now I'm writing, working on a fantasy and a contemporary at the same time but it's mm-hmm. it's 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 okay because actually the it's so different mm-hmm. yeah like the contemporary is in first person present tense you know and then the fantasy actually i'm, I'm doing third person for the first time oh yeah so actually that was more of the difficulty because i've actually all my books are first person present tense even girl and even and even rebel soul and rogue heart they're all first present Mm -hmm. so doing third pass was a was a challenge but a fun challenge yeah 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 I I mean fantasy is definitely like most of what I write almost all my stuff has like a speculative or all of my stuff has like a speculative bent um but I have I'm working on a YA contemporary ghost story so there the the speculative is that there's a ghost story but it's otherwise like a YA contemporary yeah. it's a mess um <laughs> and I love I love spooky stuff though so like you I don't know. know how spooky this is to be okay. honest this is like a sad this is kind of more on the like the sad you're right but like hum- I can't write humor to save my life like this is uh-huh. you know all my stuff is like kind of bordering on the melancholy um, I mean, I love that too. Yeah. So, you know, that, that this one is, isn't spooky. It's, it's stuff. It's like about Islamophobia and like mm-hmm. grief and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. I'll just, I'll just cry the whole time. While I'm <laughs> That's fine too. <laughs> it's rough. I, 
I almost cried really. writing it. Like, it's, just like it's, it's definitely the most book that's like taking from my own direct personal experiences. You know, it's like that's always that's just always like, yeah, yeah. This queer Persian teen in Chicago. So I'm like, here's my child. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah I mean but you're right like point of view definitely matters. that one is a mix of first person past and present because it's mm -hmm. a braided narrative the um you, the, you, uh, you do um different ages you do because you're this is adult yeah and also like yeah, you said you raised by a as well so that's that's all, that I feel like is different is to me that's more different than genre actually within an age group. yeah I would agree because but it's funny because people will read have read Kelwa and been like this is a great YA and I'm like I don't know if it's because like <laughs> I was assigned female at birth and you're calling this YA because that happens to, to female true. authors or assigned people. Right? Yeah. Um, or they're like, you didn't go deep enough with the emotions. I'm like, well, my main character has CPTSD. So they're yeah. not exactly going deep enough with their emotions yeah. or that, you know, um, but it's meant for adults. <laughs> you know, you can read it, but it's, please don't give it to your seven-year-old. Like there's a lot of medical gore. Um, but yeah, I, no, I, I love I, the medical gore, by the way. I was like, ooh, ooh, that's gross. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I had a fun time writing it. Um, but it is, it is different. I mean, I think it's, there's probably less, it's tricky. Hmm. I tend to write crossover with adults and, and YA. So my adult stuff does kind of border on, on upper YA in, in some mm -hmm. senses. Um, but uh, yeah, the middle, it's probably jumping from adult to middle grade. That's the most jarring. Cause most I just jarring. turned in, I just turned in my IP middle grade stuff that I was working on. And I'm like, this is a very, this, this is a very different story, <laughs> story from my me like medical gore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah. yeah, it's also like like how many words and on a page, you know, how many what the page looks like. Even like like a middle grade might not be as um, dense. Like YA is very very dialoguey mm. too. So that there's like a lot of white space. There's more white space in YA, I think, between middle grade and adult. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. I'm just making up stuff now. But you know what I mean? Like there's some there's some things when that you just having read a lot, you can kind of say, oh, these are things that are, that, are, that occur more often right. in these age right. groups, yeah. Yeah, yeah, age group conventions is like a thing for a reason, right? I think we can always subvert conventions, but yeah. they're there They're there for a reason, right? And, and especially when you're like on the publishing end of things, like I never, I hate that publishing can dictate like what we write. I don't think that should be the case, but off, like certainly if you're sitting to a new project and you're like, well, publishing is not going to sell this. So like, I have to try to balance that with things that are going to sell or not sell. Yeah. And it gets depressing. So I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to the depressing stuff. Um, but we are at time. Thank you all so much for Gosh. joining us. Yeah, I know. We were just like, sorry. Just, like, we'll just talk we're just everybody. having a good time. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for yeah. chatting, Axie. That was, that Thanks was so great, see this super was so fun. Much fun. So yeah, I guess we'll turn it back over to Kathleen. So. Well, I'm going to join in the round of thanks. I thank, thank you, Axie and the team, for such a lovely, fun, insightful conversation. I really did feel like I was listening to two old friends who have known each other forever and ever. It really felt that way. So, so thank you. Um, I feel like Nevada also is going to have the most beautiful book cover representing us at the National Book Festival this year. So I'm going to make sure to plug this as much as possible. Axie, <laughs> I'm going to be like, look at this book. It's our book. It's so beautiful. Um, <laughs> I know they say don't judge a book by its cover but in this case I feel like you should and then you should pick it up and read it and love what's inside as well um really I learned so much from the two of you during you know today's talk I can't wait to have um share this recording online with everyone and have them listen to you too um and I can't wait absolutely can't wait to see what the two of you publish and come up with in upcoming years I feel like you know we just love supporting you know two young absolutely talented authors and I know I'm just so you know I feel so grateful to be in your company. Um, so for people who are in the audience, you know, if you're not already signed up for our uh, emails or our uh, calendar of events, you can always sign up on our website, nevadahumanities.org. Um, that's where you can find out more information about the literary crawl coming up uh, this September in Reno, but also our other events happening online and also regionally um, in person throughout the state. Um, if you have any burning questions left over after you know today's talk or any comments that you'd like to share with us, you can always get in contact through our website, nevadahumanities.org. But also, I'm sure Axie and Asim would love to hear from you on social media. So go find them and give them a follow. So thank you again, everyone. Um, this was such a lovely time. And I hope you have a good rest of your afternoons. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for having us.